Welcome to In Pursuit. Everyone should be in pursuit of something. Join us in our discussions today with inspiring people who influence our lives and energize our understanding of what's possible. Stay in pursuit while we welcome our host, Robert Pascuzzi. All right, listeners, welcome back to another fantastic episode of In Pursuit. And today I'm with Timothy O'Donnell. Tim, welcome to In Pursuit. It's a pleasure to have you on our show today. Uh, thank you, Robert. I'm glad to be here with you. All right, all right. Well, I was really, uh, really excited to speak with you and, and hear your story. And um, as I mentioned before we started, I used to uh, do a little bit in the, the triathlon arena. Uh, nothing to your level. Uh, I was an amateur true and through, but uh, I was able to finish <laughs> my uh, my experience with triathlons uh, competing in two Ironmans, uh, actually the, the Ironman up in... Um, up in Wisconsin, I did twice in 04 and 05. So with that in mind, I'm really interested in, and in, I want you to share with the listeners a little bit about your story. And I, I think uh, it's noteworthy. Anytime you have a big goal, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, this show's all about chasing big dreams, setting, uh, you know, higher standards and, and reaching for things that seem impossible. And certainly crossing a finish line in any Ironman competition uh, is noteworthy, but you you have a worthy ideal, a burning desire, Tim, because you know to compete at your level that's a whole nother ball game, and it takes a whole nother level of commitment. And I know mindset going into something like that, but um, I, I like to call goals worthy ideals. And I want you to share with our audience, if you would please, how you got into triathlons, what really maybe motivated you, or what spark came in you know into you that made you want to get into the sport first of all what what drew you to it and then secondly tell us about how you went from maybe just getting into the sport to being one of the top triathletes in the world now yeah it's it was it's been a long journey um <laughs> uh, my my sporting career started when i was five years old uh i joined my first swim team my first summer swim team when we were living out in northern california and uh i'm the youngest of four so uh, as my older siblings got got into something, I was kind of um, didn't really have a choice. I just joined along, so that that's how it was with swimming. And we all swam. We moved or moved around quite a bit, and uh, swimming was kind of something that brought our family together and and uh, you know a mutual ground for all of us. And uh, we we grew with the sport. Started swimming uh, all year round with uh, U.S. club swimming, and, and then eventually uh, I was the accepted to the United States Naval Academy and I was recruited to be on the uh, varsity swim team. So mm -hmm. for me growing up, I was, I, I wasn't a star athlete by any means. And I think my family, when I first told them I wanted to race professional, um, kind of scratched their head because uh, of the four kids, I was probably the, um, the least talented, but uh, I, I just loved swimming and, you know, that kind of drove my passion, you know, even though I was, uh, oftentimes not qualifying for the big championship swim meets so when we were young. I was uh, lugging the, the chairs, the folding chairs for my other siblings. Uh, but, you know, I, I kept plugging along and, and ended up really developing as a swimmer and, you know, obviously going to Division One collegiate swim program. But it was at the academy where I fell in love with triathlon. Mm -hmm. And I really have to thank my older brother, Thomas, for that. He was a senior my freshman year. And if you're familiar with any of the service academies, uh, you know that when you're a freshman or a plebe, uh, if an upper class tells you to do something, you do it. It's a, it's, right. a, it's an order. <laughs> yeah. Non-negotiable. Exactly. So yeah. my older brother, Thomas, uh, he gave the order that I needed to try out for the triathlon club team. Uh, and, you know, this is 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. And at the time, not too many universities had uh, strong collegiate triathlon club programs. And fortunately, uh, the Naval Academy was one of them. So I, I tried out, I borrowed my, my brother Thomas's bike and I don't know how I made the team. I didn't, you know, didn't really run much or swim much or sorry, run much or, or bike much, but I made the team and didn't think much of it and kept swimming. And then uh, at the end of my sophomore year, I uh, finished 11th at Collegiate National and was the first finisher on the Navy team. And at that point, I felt like I had reached a plateau with my swimming career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hard work. Uh, it got me pretty far, but when it came, came down to it, I was, you know, maybe fishing in the wrong pond in terms of my uh, athletic ability. 
And uh, this sport of triathlon really started to intrigue me because it was such a, uh, just a, this combination of mental toughness, physical toughness, um, mm-hmm. you know, even, even spiritual and, and, mm-hmm. and all, like all these components of what makes you a person really, they started a show in this, in this sporting event. So, uh, for me, it, it, it just piqued my curiosity. I, I stopped swimming after my sophomore year and just focused fully on triathlon and led the uh, Naval Academy men's team to two national championships. Wow! And then, right. yep, got out, and uh, you know, I was an officer in the Navy when I when I got out, and uh, fortunately, I had uh, as a as a junior officer, I went to uh, Cal Berkeley for uh, undergrad or for um, postgraduate work through a program that the Navy has called um, uh, Immediate Graduate Education Program. So very lucky to have that opportunity. And while I was there, I started winning uh, the Armed Forces National Triathlon Championships. And, started getting the attention of, uh, of, of my higher ups and my commanding officers. And they gave me a chance to be in the world-class athlete program and go for, uh, the Olympic trials in 2008. So without the support of the Navy, uh, that really launched my triathlon career because mm-hmm. it is so hard. It's just so hard to, to get your feet on the ground in this sport. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a small sport and it takes a long time to develop, uh, as an athlete. And, uh, and it's a financially burdening, uh, burdening sport as well. So, uh, luckily I had the support of the Navy and, uh, I did not make the Olympic trial or I made the Olympic trials, but did not make the Olympic team, but I knew, uh, the Olympics are short course racing. And I knew that really my strength is going to be long course and Ironman racing. So that's when I made, uh, when I got out of the Navy in 2008, I made the switch to professional racing, uh, and trying to do long course Ironman races. And that was a, a huge sink or swim moment for me. Uh, you know, I really, I knew I had just, you know, so much money saved up. I can maybe race for a year. I had, you know, no sponsors. I had no income. Um, but if I wanted to do it, I had, I had to step up. And, and luckily I did in 2009. I won my first Ironman 70.3 and uh, I won a world championship at the end of the year. And from there, I, I just really built my, my Ironman career. Wow. Yeah, that's really, that's fantastic. You know, you touched on something there about the mental aspect of uh, competing in triathlons, Tim. And um, I know from just the two I did, um, and and I'm thinking at your level, the top athletes um, are probably from a a physical standpoint, they're pretty close. Is that that a fair statement in terms of just the physical attributes? Yeah, I'd say so. I say when you get to that top rung, um, it's, those other um, the variables that really, right. yeah, yeah, exactly that that make uh, the champion, right? Because the mental aspect of the sport, and, and again, just knowing being out there uh, 12, 14 hours—that's what it took me. But just this in that grind, can you talk about that? Because um, there are so many exit doors. I think when, when you're on a triathlon course, at least there were for me, you know, and it's like, uh, I want you to talk about that because I think that's so important. And that's what this podcast is about is in many respects is understanding that we're all created equal and we all have uh, certain gifts that we are given, but there becomes a point where we have to use the higher faculties. And when I say higher faculties, these are the gifts that God has given us, the intuition, the will, the memory, perception, all, all these things. And w- when I think about a triathlete, I think about the will. And, uh, and I think about things like perseverance and stay in the course. But what when you, when you think about um, you, know, you as a triathlete, can you talk about that, Tim? And obviously you're extremely mentally tough, but I want you to go into how you see yourself in that capacity, if you would. Sure. Um, you know, when we talk about this subject, one of the first things that comes to my mind is going back to the academy and in, in Bancroft Hall, the dormitory, there's a, a flag um, from one of the previous wars, and it, it says, don't give up the ship. I think it was on William um, uh, or Oliver Hazard Perry ship. Don't give up the ship. And mm-hmm. that's what this comes down to, right? And that's something that's really stuck in my head. Uh, throughout my my Ironman career because the races where I am in the best shape are usually 
my worst performances, particularly in Kona, wow. because you you almost have this this confidence that because you're in such good shape, you cannot fail, mm-hmm. and that's far from from the truth. And I see it with the you know I'm almost forty years old, been racing a long time, and I see it with the younger guys coming up. It's it's not about the it's not all about the shape you're in. Obviously, you have to be in, in great physical conditioning, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, when you think you're uh, invincible because you're in the best shape of your life, you are almost definitely stumble. And that's where I really started to just develop the mindset of, you know, everything I do in the race is going to allow me to have a good race, but it's not going to guarantee me that I'm going to have a great race. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean I deserve to have a great race. Uh, you know, everything you do leading up to that puts you in a position to achieve it on that day. And it, for me, that, that, that was a huge game changer from the mental mindset because when you think you're going to have an awesome race and things start to go wrong and in an 8, 10, 12, up to 17-hour race, things are going to go wrong, right, Robert? I mean, right. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you remember those points where uh, your game plan wasn't, wasn't unfolding how you wanted. Right. And, uh, and when you're, and when you think that you're going to have that awesome race and those, uh, you know, those tough times come on you, they, they really, they can really have an effect on you and they can really pull you out of the moment. So for me, I put that all aside and, um, I, I try to keep myself in only in that exact moment that I'm racing mm-hmm. because, you know, in an Ironman or in, in most things we do in life, when we look at all that we have to accomplish, um, it seems overwhelming, right? It, it's almost, a, you know, maybe you start to doubt yourself or something that you maybe start to tell yourself you can't do because it's so overwhelming. Mm-hmm. But when you stay in the moment and focus on the process that's going to achieve your goal, uh, that to me, that, that's been a huge help in, um, you know, continuing to forge on and solve problems in a very long day. Oh, I... I'm, I can relate to you so much with this, Tim, because uh, in 2005, I came back following the race I did in 2004, which I felt pretty good about being my first Ironman. So I, I was that individual that went in with, with a kind of a cocky attitude. I, I'm going to come in under, my goal was under 10 hours. And well, that day, uh, we experienced hot, all-time highs in temperature and heat, um, heat index and, and wind wind gust in Madison, Wisconsin, it was 94 degrees and they had up to 40 mile an hour wind gust. So you can imagine what that did to the bike. They had uh, oh, yeah. over five, out there oh, yeah, 500 plus DQs. But yeah, <laughs> to your point, I had to adjust my game plan from I'm coming in and at this time to I just need to finish now. And, and so it, it, it was a mental in when you think about being out there for eight, nine hours, are you saying that you're only focusing on because what I had to do, what I had to learn how to do is just focus on the next mile on the bike. Okay. I'm at mile 54. I'm just going to 55. Then I'm going to 56. That's all I thought in my mind, one mile at a time, even on the run. Is that kind of how you're doing? Are you, are you more, you're looking, you're constantly making adjustments as you're riding. I mean, what did, how do you approach the, this, the, the drag that you have to go through to be out there that long and competing from one, you know, um, you know, going from the swim to the bike to the run, how do you make the adjustments in your mind? Because you probably, you, you, I'm sure you apply the same mindset or this strategy to other things that you're doing in your life. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I think, yeah, if, if you start thinking about a 26 mile run, when you still have 105 miles left on the bike, (laughs) <laughs> you're probably you're, you're probably not putting yourself in a great position and I, yeah i think breaking it down into small parts like you said you know um some people will race kind of try to race from eight station to eight station or light post to light post for me it's um almost about getting away from time and distance and just focusing on the process so uh you know i'm very very rarely worried about um how much I have left, uh, in terms of just getting through the race. It's, um, you know, the, the 
details like my cadence on the bike or my nutrition rhythm and my, you know, I'm really only worried about mile markers or time to, to time my nutrition, right? Mm-hmm. Um, not in terms to get through it and, you know, my power on the bike or, you know, how much, um, you know, the, the power I'm producing on the bike, things like that, my shoulder position, how, and how are my aerodynamics? So I really just focus on those little details and, and staying on top of those uh, in the moment. Mm, yeah that's really good matt you want to ask a question because yeah whenever if if i hit the start line like my goal is to win this race it it doesn't help me win the race but if i say okay my i I want to win this race here are my goals within the race that are going to help me that are going to get me to that to that finish line first you know if i if i execute these things Mm -hmm. that's how i'm going to to win the race yeah, it's that blueprint or roadmap that you've got in your mind going in. And if you execute, Absolutely. you have a higher probability of, of a positive outcome. For sure. Absolutely. Matt, did you want to ask something, Matt? Yeah. So, hey, Tim. So t- I want you to, to take our listeners through moving through. I b- believe you got in a bike crash. What, what year was that? Oh, I've been in a few, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, okay, well, that's... <laughs> you, most recently, last, yeah, last, last uh, spring. I, yeah, I, so... I, I, because obviously you following you, you're you seem to have a, a very strong routine that keeps you, keeps you in a very uh, fulfilled place in your career with being able to attack these these races. So I want you to take our listeners through that experience and how you came through that on the other side, and maybe what you did to mentally not let the crash overcome you, but to overcome it. So I was Absolutely. just yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was an important part of my entire year last year and, and even the whole run up into the Ironman World Championships. Um, and I'll, I'll just rewind it a little bit, um, for you guys. Uh, the end of 2018, um, I finished fourth at the World Championships. Um, it wasn't my best finish, but, uh, it was the fastest time I've ever run in Kona. It was the fastest time by an American ever in, in, in Kona. And, I had big, I had big expectations for 2019. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, in March, I was in great fitness. I was planning on doing, uh, the Ironman North American championships in Texas in April. And I was coming downhill, um, probably going about, I don't know, maybe 45 miles an hour or so. And, uh, I was tucked in and doing an interval and I hit some sort of debris and just, blew my front wheel and I went flying, I don't know, probably 40, 50 feet away from my bike Wow! and broke a bunch of ribs mm-hmm. and, you know, I'm just lying on the side of the road first, you know, happy to be alive. Um, right. like, well, this is, this is going to throw a whole wrench in, <laughs> right. in my plan for Kona in October. But, uh, you know, we ended, we, we, we went home a couple days later and I was, I, I couldn't even lift my arm above my head. I was struggling to train. Um, you know, things, but I need to qualify for Kona, uh, at Texas if I wanted to try to win Kona. Right. Right. And I, and I struggled. I, and I, and then I started getting sick because I was putting so much stress on myself and mm-hmm. so much internal pressure and almost all, you know, we, we feel like we have a lot of pressures, but it's usually a pressure that we internalize. That's, that's the most detrimental to ourselves. And that's exactly what I was doing. I wasn't able to make the start line at Texas. Uh, then I tried to get to the start line in May at Ironman Brazil. Couldn't do it. Um, and then I barely got to the start line in June in Boulder. And really it all came from my wife, uh, Marinda. Uh, her nickname is Rainey, and she's a three-time Ironman world champion. And she just finally said, you know, Tim, stop. You know, <laughs> Just let your body heal, mm-hmm. and you'll – you'll, when you get to the start line, you get to the start line and you'll figure out, you know, you'll, you'll figure out how to get to Hawaii. So I said, okay. What and, great advice. You know, one, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it always it, comes with that. That reminds me of my <laughs> wife, Tim. She always is the voice of reason when I'm trying to drive off a cliff or something, but I'm sorry. Right, right. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> no, no, but you're absolutely right. Like yeah. when you're in it, when you're in the weeds, it's so hard to see. Right. And, uh, you know, hopefully you have great people around you, spouses or advisors or friends that can, help you steer when when you got the blinders on so right. she she took me out of that tailspin that i was in mm-hmm. and um you know i got the start line in, in june and 
here I am. I'm, you know, I hadn't raced all season. I was not in, uh, not in the, the best shape. I over swam and over biked and I, I, I got off the bike with a couple minute lead, but then I just absolutely fell apart, uh, because I was, you know, I, I, it was, you know, I kind of went in over my head a little bit and I had about, I needed to get third to qualify for Kona and I had about 10 miles left and I was about to pull out of the race, uh, cause I felt so bad. And, uh, at that position, I, I'd fallen back to third already. The rest of the field was coming at me hard and, uh, I started walking a little bit and I'm like, no, you know what? I'd come to, um, <laughs> I'd come to grips with the fact that I wasn't going to go to Hawaii and I was rationalizing in my head that, it, you know, oh, you need a year off anyways. Right. And then I thought about my, my daughter, Isabel, who's just about to turn three. And I said, you know what? I'm going to, I don't care if I qualify for Kona, but I'm, I'm not going to pull out. I'm going to get to that finish line and I'm going to hold my head up high and, you know, give my baby girl a hug yes. and I'm going to set the example for her. Uh, about not quitting. And mm-hmm. once I took the idea out of my head that I was going to quit or I could, or that quitting was an option, everything came back together. All of a sudden, I didn't need to walk. My legs felt fine. I got back in my run rate of rhythm and I held onto the podium and, and qualified for Kona. So it's such a testament to that mental space we were talking about earlier uh, that you have to be in the right space. And, uh, you know, when you take out the options of quitting or failing, it, it makes it a lot, a lot easier to, to to move forward and, and try to achieve your goals. Well, that's so, so well said. It's so simple, but it's not easy. You know, no, it's that old cliche, <laughs> it's simple, but it's not easy. You know, when you were describing that, Tim, that's really cool. And it reminded me of that, that second race I did in 05 when 500 people are dropping out on the bike. I mean, just everywhere. And, the only reason I didn't bail was because my wife had brought my two kids. They were a lot smaller at that time, but they were at the finish line. And I, and same thing. I'm like, I can't, I, I have to finish, yeah. you know, I have to finish. And I think that's just a, what that means to me is what I found in my life is we'll do twice as much for other people that we really care about than we'll do for ourselves. So if you, if you find enough reasons why the answers always come, and we can apply this. Yep. This isn't just, you know, sports. It's anything we want to do in our life. We, we just, Tim, I told you before we started, we're, uh, we're going to screen, um, our movie, the ravine, which was based off a novel that I, I wrote and was published in 2014. Um, we began that project in 2011 and the book, and then now it's moved on into the movie. And so it's been about a nine year process and, um, to see it coming to life on the big screen, like you said, if if we, if you just won't quit, there were so many jumping off points that we could have, my wife, Kelly and I could have stopped on this journey. And it's, um, it's so fulfilling to see it come true. And I'm sure, you know, for you being able to stand on that podium, um, I mean, there's, there's no better feeling, right? I mean, there's no better feeling than saying, you know, Hey, I did it. And, and Absolutely. so that's what it's, and I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, a lot of the reward we get is not from the result, but through the struggles we overcome on the journey. Right. Absolutely. Um, that brings so much value to it. And I think, you know, having, I think that's why a lot of people find, um, joy in, in, in the sport of triathlon is because there is that struggle that they have to face. And, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's a really important part to how we uh, develop as individuals. Great point. I, and Tim, I looked at it back when I was doing this. Um, I looked at it like if I can do this, if I can do, if I can cross this finish line today, I can do anything. So it was a metaphor for me. And and I think that's, that's what you're saying because it's, it's the, when we go for those big goals, those bodacious goals, it's not getting the goal. It's what it makes us in pursuit of it. Right. To actually to get there, who, who you have to become in the process. And I think that's what you're saying. Absolutely. And uh, to go back to your point earlier, Robert, about, um, you know, kind of giving more when it's um, not just for yourself, but for others. I think that's been an important part of my development as an athlete as well. You know, your motivations change as as you get older. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was young, it was just, I just want to prove to everybody that I can do this. Everybody that said I couldn't do it, I'm going to prove to you that I can do it. You know, and then you start winning and then you're like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get sponsors and, and make a career out of this and, you know, you know, and, and set myself up financially. And then you start to do that. And then you're like, well, shoot, now what, what am I doing it for? And then, you know, 
once we had our daughter Isabel, you know, that all kind of changed and, and sure. you know, yeah. everything became focused on her, setting an example for her and, you know, and, um, you know, setting things up for her. And, uh, it just, and we got to travel as family, right? This, you know, Rennie, myself and Izzy, we travel the world together and, and all of a sudden all this stuff we're doing is us, you know, it's something that we're doing. It's not an individual thing. And that's really gave, given, um, you know, a, a second wind to my career, to be honest. Absolutely. And that's so cool that you guys can all do it together. In 2019, Tim, when you, when you took second in Kona, how did you feel about it? I mean, in one respect, you, you, you had to feel really good about it. You came in second, but I'm thinking that there also has to be almost, it's maybe a little bit of the other two that, man, I was that, that close, right. To, to breaking the tape. But I mean, how do you look at that? Well, um, I'm going to continue a little bit, Robert, on the story of the, of the year after uh, Boulder and everything because uh, the year didn't get easier. I actually broke my foot seven weeks prior to the Ironman. No World way. You broke your year as well. Seven weeks? Yeah. I, oh, my <laughs> Lord. I broke my fifth metatarsal. So by the, by the end of July, I uh, had got, gotten back into shape, had an amazing race in um, Santa Rosa and was really excited for the year. Yeah, I had only raced two times before Kona. Usually I raced maybe six or seven times. Uh, so it was a light year. But here I am finally excited that the year has turned around and seven weeks out from, from the big show, I, I uh, hit the edge of uh, the road on the, literally the last step of my, my training run and rolled my ankle, inverted my ankle, and, and broke my fifth met. Wow. So <laughs> I... Uh, you're, you're you like, know, what I, else I went, can go wrong, huh? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. oh, come on. I would throw my hands up in the air. I went and got an x-ray. They're like, oh, no, it's fine. And then a week later, we didn't feel, I still couldn't put weight on it. I couldn't run. So I went and got an MRI, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's definitely broken. So uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I went home. I had a bottle of wine. And I said, all right, you're gonna, you, you can sulk. Because at this point, I'm like, I'm six weeks out from the World Championship. There's no way I'm going to be, be able to race. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, I had a bottle of wine. I'm like, you get one night that you can have a pity party and then tomorrow you get back on your horse and you figure out, you know, what you can do to try to get to that start line. Hmm. And hmm. That, that was a, a big lesson is, uh, in learning to only focus on what you keep, what's in your control. You know, I couldn't control the fact that my foot was broken or that I couldn't hunt. Um, but I could work on my cycling on the trainer and my swimming with a pull buoy in. Right. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, and then a couple of weeks before the race, I was able to get on a zero gravity treadmill, which um, if anybody's not familiar with it, it, uh, it actually lifts your body weight. Um, so you can run it. If you weigh 150 pounds, you can, you know, run at 50, 60% of your body weight, run at 80 pounds. So it takes all that pressure off of the foot. And I started doing that. And I did my first run outside um, right before I left for Kona, which was about eight or nine days before the event. And actually, I know you guys are in in Kansas City. Uh, We do our pre-Kona training in Lawrence, Kansas. Oh, really? uh, Wow. Yeah. um, Yeah. Great, great place. Uh, Rolling Hills, uh, super nice people. Um, And and luckily, one of the the strength coaches at at KU uh, let me use their zero-gravity treadmill because they're they're super hard to find. Uh, so That's big shout cool. out to the team and Lawrence for, for all your support. I've got two boys, uh, two of my, my older boys at my, I've got three boys. The two older ones are, are up at KU students at KU. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. It's such a great, such a great community. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have thought you would be training in, uh, in Kansas. That's interesting. Is that with, yeah, the, you know, we, is that <laughs> we with were Matt the Hansen? first, uh, yeah, Matt Hansen was there. Yep. He's part of, uh, Julie Dibbins is our coach. So we're, kind of part of that training group but uh we did it in 2018 for the first time mm-hmm. and we said okay we want somewhere we can drive uh we're up at altitude in boulder and i wanted to come down to sea level uh, okay. to get you can get a little more out of your body at sea level and recover a little bit quicker right. and uh we're like okay well kansas is kind of it's still pretty hot and humid that time of year and it's good roads to ride on and it's um at sea level so it's really the perfect fit Interesting. And, and Matt yeah. Hansen, the reason I bring him up is because when I was watching the Boulder Ironman, that was the same race you were talking about when you were thinking mm-hmm. of, uh, of Izzy. And I remember just watching that from Facebook live and just like, I can only imagine 
what it's like being on the field when you don't know where that runner is behind you. And I know Matt Hansen crushes his runs always, and he's that's one thing he's known for. But what what, what was that like when you when you saw he won that that uh, the Boulder? He Iron did. Yep. Year? Yep. Um, yeah, you know, obviously good friends with Matt, uh, and he uh, has the I think he has the record for the fastest marathon in Ironman ever. So he is. Well, wow. uh, when it comes to running and triathlon, he is, he is, uh, he's the guy to look out for. And honestly, he was running so fast that, uh, you know, I had, I maybe I had four minutes on him off the bike or something. And he caught me pretty quick. I just, when I was getting the updates, I just started laughing. I mean, I knew <laughs> there was nothing I was going to do. Yeah. You know, he's coming. Tim, but yep. go back then. So you, you were able to get, get back running about a week before Kona. Mm-hmm. So about a week before I did my first run outside Mm -hmm. and I actually felt, I felt really good. Luckily, you know, my foot held up and, um, the cool thing about that zero gravity treadmill is you get all that neuromuscular, um, a memory and that firing pattern without the wear and tear on your body that you would on this normal training session. Right. So I was in this place where I was, because I wasn't running, I was riding really, really well because, you know, I didn't have as much fatigue in my body. And uh, I had this weird confidence that, so, hey, maybe, who knows how this is going to happen, but, you know, maybe maybe you can do something. You know, maybe you're, you know, you, you haven't been able to win this race yet. Maybe doing something different and being forced to do something different will be, be your, your key to success. So, um, and the mindset was a huge change, too. Right. What, you know, yeah, you love something so much and you almost take it for granted. I've been doing that race since 2011. And here I was, it was about to be taken away from me. Mm-hmm. And when I had the chance and when I knew I could go race, I was just filled with so much joy and gratitude that, you know, the pressure of trying to, um, to win and the pressure of doing better than I'd done the year before. Uh, and just historically, uh, for everyone, the, the winner of the men's race since I think 2004 has come out of the, someone from the top four from the year before. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> you know, I, I had, I was in a good spot. Right. Uh, you, know, yeah. the, the, you know, one of the guys that could do it. Uh, but that was all lifted and I was just filled with joy and gratitude. And um, that just changed my whole perspective on race day for the better. Yeah. When you came off the bike that day, what position were you in? Uh, I was in second. Okay. So you held second. Yep. Yeah. So we were, uh, you know, uh, we had a good swim group and we probably had five or six of us um, that got away in the swim and we were all good riders and we had we stayed away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then at the, at the back half of the ride, I found, my, found myself with uh, Jan Ferdano, who uh, was the eventual winner. And he had he had won the race two times already and he had won the gold medal in 2008. And the other guy in our threesome was uh, a guy named Alistair Brownlee, who is the 2012 and the 2016 gold medalist. So uh, the three of us are off the front, and I'm thinking to myself, "Not too shabby of a lineup there." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's, there's three gold medals in this group, and I don't wow. have any of them. <laughs> wow, so that's in the right cool. spot. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, so, um, so lo- looking ahead, then you, you finished second last year. Now uh, it, the pandemic disrupts everything. Can you talk to the listeners about how how have you used the pandemic, Tim, to um, maybe? restructure your game plan or I don't know how much it's affected your goals because this year has kind of been washed out. Um, but give us your thoughts on the pandemic in terms of just not, not just your training and, uh, Ironman training, but just, you know, your perspective on life and where you see yourself going and, uh, going forward here. Well, yeah, it's been, um, you know, obviously a difficult year for everyone, um, participation in sports and the endurance community. Um, you know, we are, we've been, you know, very impacted by it. We haven't, we haven't raced this season. Uh, I'm not sure if we will. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it's been tough, especially, you know, you know, you only have, you can't race at the top forever and to have, you know, one, one of my best chances taken away this year. Um, it, it's tough to deal with, but at the same time, like I said earlier, it's not something I can control. So I can't, um, you know, I can't cry over spilt milk at this point. Uh, I just need to, <laughs> you know, kind of move on. And, and this year has been, uh, almost reset for us, you know, stepping back, recovering from everything we've done over the years. And, and we haven't had a real break from racing in, you know, really 20 years. Right. So wow. yeah. for us, you know, might be a, might be a, a blessing, blessing in disguise. Yes. In disguise. Yeah. And extend our career a little bit too. Um, you know, we tend to all try to race as much and 
try to make make uh, hay while the sun shines, right? And and uh, this has kind of forced us to take a step back, spend more time with our daughter, which has been amazing. Uh, she's at such a fun age right now, and it, it you know it's it's a big stress. So we're, we've tried to turn our training into um, you know I guess not the number one priority. So we'll do three weeks of our normal training, and then we'll do a, week, a family week where we'll um, be on structured training and go for advent and adventures and things like that. So it's, it's been a welcome little break, but um, yeah, it's yeah, at the same time, you have to keep your eye on next year. And um, it's been a nice, nice um, break for us. Yeah. And how have I, I'm, I'm just really curious because uh, you know, with your wife being a, an elite athlete as well and uh, accomplishing so much, has that been, I mean, is there a comp, is there, I'm sorry, I'm just so competitive, Tim. And my, my <laughs> wife, my wife played college basketball. I played college baseball and I just know the competition. We like to have fun with each other sometimes when we're doing various, you know, sports. How's that, how, what's the dynamic with you and your wife when it comes to competing for triathlons? Yeah, it's been, <laughs> um, you know, everything's been in fun. Um, uh, it's it's hard. It's definitely hard when you know triathlon. I would say it's a pretty selfish sport, mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes you're always competing for <laughs> for the attention and support. Right. But uh, you know, we both value family and relationships very highly, and for us, having a strong family is always our number one priority, uh, even over our careers and winning races. So, you know, we've been definitely been able to kind of get through that uh without any big issues and i think we've been smart about having our own teams that support us separately as well whether it be managers coaches things like that uh because at some point you do need people that are just thinking about you and not the both of you uh and then after that it's, it's all just lighthearted fun you know we uh, you know Rennie's won that race three times uh and i i know if she had a choice whether i would win one or she would win another one um i know she would say me so yeah, uh, I think we're on the same page. All right. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. All right. <laughs> yeah, check that box, Tim. That it, it's pretty. That's it, the plan. Is there a hus- husband and wife combo that have one Kona together, each one? Uh, no, there isn't. Uh, oh man, you got to get it done then. Yeah, you got to. Do I don't it. think oh, there was. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> there was one, but they uh, <laughs> there's one couple that had separated. They had, the one of them one after they had separated, but yeah, no married couple. Uh, You're gonna we, do uh, it, Tim. Yeah, you're gonna that's get it the done. goal. Yeah, yeah. We, we were trying to we were trying to do it together, uh, but uh, I dropped the ball too many times when when Rennie was winning. <laughs> oh gosh, that's gotta be just so crazy. You guys are both actually, in the same race. Wow. Yeah, we try. We normally we kind of race uh, separate events, uh, but you can't avoid racing that race together. Uh, oh man, that's kind of that's really cool though. You're able to do it do it together. Right. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, my best races have been her her worst races so it's almost like sometimes uh you know it's hard to get there's so much energy in the house it's hard to get you know (laughs) get it to both both athletes out in the race course oh man i can't even imagine that i remember how crazy i would just hype you're so hyped you know and then you guys are both doing it the same day very cool well well this has been so much fun tim i want to ask one more question um looking back on your career um, in your life, what are you most grateful for? Uh, honestly, family, um, not, you know, not just Rennie and Isabel, but, but my parents and my siblings, um, I was very blessed to have a strong family. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we moved around a lot. Uh, my sister went to three high schools. So whenever we would go somewhere new, we just had the O'Donnell's and, uh, that really grew us, you know, brought us together and, and, uh, you know, we're all still very close and, I've learned so much from my parents on, uh, you know, how to, how to represent yourself and how to do the right thing and prioritize, um, you know, goals and obviously family. Right. And we've, we've been able to kind of translate that into our family with Rennie and Isabel. And, uh, my dad's nickname is the Dista. So, uh, we always say, what would the Dista do? Because we just, you know, we value his integrity as, as a person and obviously as a parent. And, uh, yeah, we're just so blessed to have, to have all that good guidance that's been in our lives. Wow, it's so important. That's a great, great thing to touch on. I mean, to have that foundation, I had the same um, 
foundation with with my parents. My dad just recently passed away, but it was uh, when I talked at his eulogy. The one thing that that he left us in the imprint was always the integrity and the value system. So I can totally relate to what you're saying. I, that's that's really cool because it obviously is, you know. It carries over into everything you do in your life and it gets you through the rough patches. Um, Tim going into, uh, so, you know, 19, maybe, you know, you don't get back out there, but maybe you do, but, um, can you leave us with, um, what, what big audacious goal? Uh, I think I, I think it's pretty obvious, but, uh, tell the audience, if you would, what are you gunning for? What's that big thing that you still have it, you know, in front of you that keeps you in pursuit? Honestly, uh, you know, it's always, I'm not going to say it's a moving target um, because I, <laughs> winning the Ironman World Championships is, is, is it and it's been it for a while. Mm-hmm. But um, but motivation now, you know, uh, there's never been a 40 year old to win to win that event. So uh, I would love to be the first 40 year old uh, to win the Ironman World Championships in 2021. Right on, man. You, you've got so much going for you. <laughs> and going into next year, you're going to be the first husband-wife combo and the first 40-year-old. Yes. It's gonna... Yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> see, you're getting all... see, Tim, what you're doing is you're getting all these reasons why you want. Get, get as many reasons why, right? And yep. you're going to get Absolutely. some big reasons ahead of you here. It's going to happen. I can't wait to oh, watch you, you compete uh, the next time you're out on the course. It's going to be fun. Well, Tim, thanks again. It, it, it's been a real pleasure and uh, I know you're going to have the success you're looking for and um, world records are going to be broken. So we're, we're looking forward to oh, watching you, you out there. Well, yeah, ladies, we have great support. You got great support. <laughs> yes, yeah, you do. You got great support and it's powerful. Well, I know, I know your wife's going to be the first one at the finish line when you come across and break that tape in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With, with little Isabel. Exactly. You know, I was at, um, we, we took the boys down to the Hawaiian islands. We did a, we did a cruise a couple of years ago and went, and then I got to go into where, you know, where the swim starts. And I went into that, that shop right there where, where it's ground zero and the owner of the, the, the shop, I don't remember what it was. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. It's the Ironman shop, but he gave me the whole history and was showing me all the photos and everything. And he had all the pictures of every year's winner. So I know the next oh, wow. one to be up there is going to be Tim O'Donnell. I want to get my glamour shot ready. That's right. That's right. All right, Tim. Well, you take care. And uh, folks, thanks for being on another terrific episode of In Pursuit today. And again, you're with Tim O'Donnell. And um, Tim, can you tell our listeners if they want to follow you on, on your social media platforms where they can find you? Absolutely. Um, our YouTube channel is the Tim and Rini show. Uh, you can subscribe to that. And then on Instagram, T O N try, or just look for Timothy O'Donnell. Okay. Fantastic. All right, Tim. Great. Thanks so much again. Thank you and, so much. Uh, and we'll be talking soon. Take care. Cheers, Robert. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much, Tim. This has been another special edition of In Pursuit with your host, Robert Pascuzzi. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed our program. And remember, everybody should be in pursuit of something.